Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Rodrigo, like John said. I am a Portuguese, so I am the home player um, this year. And with Dialog, the main project I've been involved in has been the overhaul of Mastering Dialog APL. So naturally, the question I've been asked the most this conference is if I was the one choosing this place, and I was not, okay? I joined Dialog after this venue was chosen. All right, so when I was preparing this presentation, I came up with plenty of different jokes I could make, but this is my first Dialog user meeting, so I'm not really sure how you react to jokes and to what kind of jokes, but I decided to risk it. So let's open with a joke. So a Portuguese and an American walk into a bar. I'm the Portuguese one here. <laughs> and they wrote a paper. So it's, I have a dry sense of humor, but this is the joke. So me and Aaron, which is this good-looking fellow, we wrote a paper, and today I will be talking a little bit about the paper, and especially about the code that was shown in this paper. Now, I don't really know how you react to this, but I would be a little bit intimidated if a talk were about the paper, but it's going to be lightweight. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to present, so don't be afraid. Let's start by dissecting the title so you know what I'm about to talk, what I'm going to talk about. So this is the thing we built. It's called a UNET CNN. This is what we are building in the paper. Then we are obviously doing it in APL because what else would you use? And then the subtitle essentially means we are doing it from scratch. Obviously because we can, right? And I also said this is a paper that was written by me and Aaron, so throughout the talk, I will try to say we did, we thought, we decided to, but it's, I'm, I'm making a remark like John Daintry did earlier. When I say we, I really mean Aaron, because he, <laughs> <laughs> he, did, he did most of the, of the heavy lifting. I just helped with a couple of things here and there. So, yeah. What is it that we are talking about? What's the UNET CNN thingy I mentioned? So the CNN is just an acronym for Convolutional Neural Network. I'm not going to go into details. If you want details, you can come after and talk to me or Aaron. We will gladly spend our hours talking about this. But the neural network is just a pile of linear algebra. It's, uh, I really enjoy this XKCD comic because it really it summarizes machine learning quite well. It's just a pile of linear algebra and by mathematical magic, it just it works as a what do you call it? The, 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 the divination balls. Um, it just does magic, you know. You give. A crystal ball. Sorry. Magic eight ball. Crystal. I actually was looking for the crystal ball. It's kind of like a crystal ball. You ask it questions. Some computations happen, then you get answers. Sometimes they're correct. When they're not correct, you just stir the pile until things become better. So that's a neural network in a nutshell. And the convolutional here is just a specific type of neural network in which we, are, we work with convolutions. Now think of images. Convolutional neural networks are often used with images. So if I have an image that's going to be represented by this blue square, I could convolve it with this um, kernel here, which is a smaller matrix. Think of a smaller matrix that's going to slide over the image in different positions and then through a little bit of linear algebra, going to compute a new position in our final image. Now, this is very easy to express in APL because it's just a stencil, the kernel multiplied by my sub-window, and then summing everything. So this is, in a nutshell, what a CNN is. Now, what's a UNET CNN? It's just an arrangement of weird things. So the U comes from the shape of this, and this is the diagram of the, or, the original paper that presented the UNET CNN. Think of it just as a composition of several different convolutions in a specific order that makes sense to arrange in this diagram here. So we wanted to build this. But why did we want to build this? Why did we want to do this from scratch? What was the point? Well, Aaron has his points. I joined him because I thought they were valid points. 
to me, the, most, the two most important ones then the two that are the easiest to explain are, as you've seen, it was just a very short expression. APL looks good for CNNs. I mean, APL has stencil for you, so a convolution is very easy to express. So it looks like APL is a good fit for CNNs. But is it? Let's find out. Also, if it is good, is it any... Is it a decent match for, the, for what the industry uses? Is it any match for the libraries and frameworks that are used throughout the whole world? Because we want things to, be, to execute on a decent level of speed, otherwise it makes no sense to even bother implementing this in APL. And luckily, by chance, Aaron has been working on a compiler, so let's just see if it's fast enough. You know, is it competitive enough? And so what we did was we implemented the unit in APL, and by we, remember, I mean Aaron, we compared the code and its performance to the industry standard, we compared the code size and the runtime performance, and then we discussed advantages and disadvantages of our approach in the paper. Standard stuff, I would say. Now, what did I learn by working with Aaron? Because Aaron had already been working with this, um, on this, and I thought, I, I don't even remember how I heard that Aaron was working on this, but he was stuck, and so I thought, I'll join, I'll help, and hopefully learn a bunch, which I did. So, what things did I learn? The unit looks like this. This doesn't look like a square, it doesn't look like a rectangle, so how am I going to save this structure in an APL array? Because APL is very nice, it works with multidimensional arrays, but how do I fit this in an array? And to be completely honest with you, ever since I started working with Aaron on this, other than the solution that he found, I haven't been able to come up with a different solution, let alone a solution that's better than his. So it was quite interesting to see how we actually ended up fitting this into an array. And to me this is difficult because I even struggled arranging these 2D tables for my wedding, because I'm getting, I'm getting married next Sunday. You can clap now, I can wait. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So 2D tables was already hard for me, and we were dealing with 4D things. But let's see how we did this. So we have this structure here, and we came up with this. Now what does this mean? Let's start with the bottom, I think it's easier, because I always get confused if I start from the top. So CV, CV, MX, that's going to be, the CV is the blue arrows. All, all of the blue arrows are CVs. And these two CVs, they're these two. So CV, CV, MX. The MX is the down arrow. And then the two next to it, the CV, CV, up, they're CV, CV, up. So what we realized was that Hidden behind this U, there was some symmetry here, because these two that are going down, as you can see, there's the, by the direction of the arrows, we start by going right, down, right, down, right, down, right, down, right, up, right, up, right, up, right, up, right, I got lost. But the idea is that, right? So that line over there, the bottom line there, is this thing here, going right and down, and then the right half is going right and up. So this line right here, that's going to be CV, CV, MX, that's going to be these two. So we are going right and down, and that's paired up with going right and up. So this here is paired up with this, and that one over there, there, right down, is paired up with right up. So this was an interesting way of arranging this, and these three arrows right here, they're stored in a different vector because they, they don't really fit into this model. And so this is just a diagram to really show how things are going. So when I'm going down the U, I start over there, I, I go right, right, down, and then I go right, right, down, right, right, down, right, right, down. That's what's going on in here. And to go up, I'm going right up, right up, right up, etc. And so because I did this, now I'm going right up, right up, right up, etc. So this was an interesting way of storing things, and it was an even more interesting implementation. Now, I've told Aaron 
uh, in person that sometimes I look at his code and I feel like slapping him. <laughs> Which is, it's my personal reaction to his code sometimes. But things have a reason, all right? Aaron is not a stupid person, okay? So things have a reason. This FWD that stands for forward is supposed to represent the flow of an input there that goes through the U and out. And these five lines of code, they represent the five different types of arrows that we find here. Who can guess? So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between those five names and these five arrows. Now, Aaron, you cannot answer, obviously. Who can guess which one of these five matches the blue arrow, the convolution? Don't be shy. Yeah, okay, so CV matches this one. Now, obviously, which one matches copy and crop? CC, right. And then max is going to be matched by MX, up matches up, and this convolution, this one by one convolution, is the C1 right there. Okay, so thankfully, Aaron listed these in this same order. That was quite convenient here. <laughs> and then, this was not supposed to be a joke, this was actually quite convenient. <laughs> And then what's hidden here is the way in which we take these five functions and actually express this flow. Because we only arranged, so the things I showed you before, do I feel like going back? I do. These things here, they actually hide some data that's inherent to each arrow, but we still have to express the actual flow of the image coming in at the top and going through the network. So how did we, <coughs> Aaron, express this? with this terrible function here, which looks terrible, but really isn't. Because what I learned from studying Aaron's code is that at first sight you feel like slapping him, but it's actually, it's, it's decently thought through. So you end up learning things when you look at it. Now, I thought that LA here stood for, I don't even remember, line application, because I thought we were, this here was applying the lines in that pattern, but it actually stands for layers. So sometimes you have to guess what the two and three letter names mean. But what's happening here is, if you look at it closely, we start from the right, obviously. So it's, it's the two CVs that we mentioned, and then the MX. So that's going to be CV, CV, MX. Then we go down. Conveniently, recursion is pointing down. So we go down, and we do CV, CV, MX again. And we do this a bunch of times until there's nowhere to go down, and so we, got, we get up. And then we do CV, CV, up, which is this thing right here. And then we are going up the recursion, so we go CV, CV, up again, CV, CV, up, CV, CV, up. And when we are done, we have those three left, remember, because they didn't really fit the, the rectangle nicely, and that's just CV, CV, C1. So this was, it looks intimidating, but it ended up looking like a, a very natural expression of how the data flows throughout the network. So that was interesting. Now, what else did I learn? Now, you cannot find this in the dialogue documentation, but I found out that if you go to a Chinese restaurant, and if you show you know the culture, they'll give you a secret menu that's reserved for people who somehow belong in there. <laughs> now, I've never been able to verify this, but if you have, come see me afterwards, because I've only heard of this from Aaron and this movie right here. I was actually sitting, I think I was eating something, I almost spit my soup <laughs> when I saw this, because I thought Aaron was just joking with me, but apparently this is a thing. But I learned other things, I learned other things, if, if the clicker, yeah, collaborates. So, inner products are super useful. I'm, I studied mathematics, and so I'm... Maybe this is controversial, but I'm kind of used to things that don't look useful. But it's, this is also not a joke. Sometimes things don't look useful. But that doesn't mean it's not worth studying them, understanding the patterns and the way it relates to everything else we know, right? And for some time, I thought inner products were just a weird generalization of matrix multiplication. But as it turns out, from studying this code, the code for the unit, and the code for the codifference compiler, and the code for the way Aaron handles trees, we can actually see that inner products, they're everywhere. And just in our forward function, we have three of them. And sadly, it's only matrix multiplication in higher dimensions, but they are really useful. They make a lot of sense. And especially, 
if you play well with your axes. So if you arrange your axes carefully, inner products are going to be awesome, and they're going to make your life so much easier. So that was nice. I also learned that Stencil has some optimized left operands. So for our MX function that you've seen before, this would arguably be a more, well, definitely a simpler, a simpler way of expressing what we wanted. So let's see how much time do I have. I have time for this. So this is what it could have been, right? And I'll show you the dimensions that are playing a part here. Let me increase the font size, because otherwise I will be screen that. Now let me fix the font. And now let me go, let me get that out of the way. So let me create a matrix. That's going to be a three-dimensional cuboid, which is what goes into the network. It's a, is it? It is. It's a three-dimensional thing. Now, what I showed was this expression. It was a, a first axis reduction twice. And it's incredible how much my hands are shaking. <laughs> Even though I just I enjoy presenting so much, and I have some experience, but it, it still doesn't pre prevent me from shaking uncontrollably. So this is, is it too small still? It's OK. It's OK? OK. Well, it's already three dimensions, so I can't make it much bigger. Um, so yeah, this, this was the expression, what could have been, right? And what, what is this? So let me comment that, and let's take this portion out. Uh, actually, there's nothing I can break, so let me walk, walk you through it. I have a three-dimensional thing, but my right operand to stencil is only two dimensions. So what's going to happen is my windows, the windows I will be looking at, will be two, um, sorry, they will encompass the two planes, because it's a two in the first dimension, and then the first two rows of each plane, so these two and these two, and then because the third dimension is not specified, I'll be taking all of the columns. So essentially, I will be splitting this M into two pieces, right? The piece with the first two rows and the piece with the last two rows. And then I'm doing a first axis reduction twice, so what I'll be doing is I will be finding the maximum of these four values, the maximum of these four values, the maximum of these four values, etc. That's what's happening. And so I should get... One parenthesis too much. Sorry? One parenthesis too much. One parenthesis too much. I don't think so. Um, do you mean these two? Because this one is closing this one. If I can select it, yeah, and this one. No worries, thank you, because I could have had one parenthesis too much, and then I would be embarrassing myself. Um, yeah, so this here, this 0, 3, 8, 5, it's the maximum of these four values. Everyone agrees? If you agree, you can clap now. <laughs> Come on. Okay, no, you're falling asleep already, yeah. So this is what it could have been, but this is not what we used. This is what we used. It looks scarier, at least to me. But the thing is, this right here, this left operand, which is just omega, this is optimized with a stencil or within the stencil operator. So this is me just capturing those smaller windows and doing nothing with them. And so after omega goes through here, suddenly I have a five-dimensional object, and then I'm putting these two um, axis together, so after this revel I have a four-dimensional object, and then after this maximum reduction I have a three-dimensional object again. And this one runs, I don't know how much, how much faster it should be for me to be able to say significantly faster, but let's say it runs significantly faster than this one. So this was an interesting thing, learning about the optimized left operands. And then I learned something on top of this, Sorry, I have the clicker. I don't need to click my, my computer. This is rude, right? If I, stand, if I turn my back to you, this is considered rude, so let's not do that. Yeah. So I also learned that optimizing idioms is a combinatorial problem, because this is an optimized idiom. What if I put a left, what if I put a tech over there, a right tech over there? Still the same thing, I just want omega. 
And what if I add another tag and another tag and another tag? Or what if instead of using a different, I write this just with a right tag? Or, you know, what if I do some function that's not written exactly like this, but essentially does, it, does exactly the same thing? That's not optimized because I have all of these different ways in which I could express the same semantic meaning, but not write the exact same code. And that's going to be a pain if the dialogue team has to maintain all the possible combinations of ways of writing just this. So that was also an interesting thing I learned. And all in all, in a more overarching scheme of things, like the, the, the 10,000 feet view of things I learned, I, just, I essentially learned that APL code tends to take a bit more to digest, or it takes a bit more for you to be convinced that you've understood something. Now, I'm also not trying to make a joke here, because I've been writing APL code for less than three years, right? So I'm, a, I'm very young in this, in this world. And we sent this paper, we sent our paper to a conference that's a non-APL conference, and we got very interesting replies. And one of the things I interpreted from the reviews was, reviewers, because they are not knowledgeable in APL, by glancing at the code, they cannot be convinced they understand what's going on. Whereas if I just glance at a page of Python code or Java code, I'll have English words mixed in there, I'll have my uh, traditional control structures, I can convince myself I kind of get the general idea. But with APL, I have to look at it, I have to understand what's going on. And so, hence, it takes a bit to digest, it takes a bit for me to convince myself I kind of understand what's going on. But once I do, I feel like I have superpowers, because it's not a question of memorizing, it's a, question of, it's a matter of understanding, and if you understand, you can replicate, you can experiment, you can explain. And that's pretty much how I did my, my maths degree, right? I don't, memorizing theorems alone isn't enough. You have to understand them so you can make connections with related theorems, with related ideas, and then produce new knowledge. So this, is, this pretty much summarizes how I feel about APL. So essentially, just go study the paper, because there's plenty of interesting there, uh, things there. There's a lot I did not cover, I could not cover, things I don't even understand completely yet. Um, but there's lots of interesting discussions there about APL. And by the way, I didn't even mention this, but our runtime results, they were quite competitive when compared to the PyTorch implementation we used that I wrote, so I did contribute something. So it was only two times slower when compared to the industry standard that's been written by, did it have, what, 2,000 contributors or something? Yeah, something like that that has been written and tested and optimized throughout the years. So our results were actually quite nice. So now I have plenty of time for questions. I will take the simpler ones, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you.